In today's economy, more people than ever are looking to buy and sell businesses. But how do you do it? Welcome to The Deal Board, presented by Transworld Business Advisors. Straight talk about real deals and real people. Listen to stories, interviews, and expert advice to help your business sale, merger, or acquisition process. Now, here are your business exit experts, Andy and Jessica. Hey, welcome back, everybody. So today, we're going to talk about one of the tougher things in buying a business, we're going to talk about landlord issues. And, you know, the specific thing about landlords is that, you know, a lot of businesses, it's all about location, 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 right? The three most important things to a retail business or even sometimes any business. So uh, location, location, location is then governed by a lease and then governed by the landlord if they don't happen to own the business. So, We see that this is a huge issue coming into uh, getting a deal done. Uh, We eventually have to deal with the landlords, and landlords range from small little landlords to large REITs. And so in in working with these landlords, um, there are specific times in an economic cycle that are you have to work it differently. You just have to look at uh, what the current marketplace is is driving. And, you know, sometimes the landlords are going to be easy. Sometimes the landlords are going to be tough. So we're seeing that now, right, Jessica? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's when a market is is performing well and we're in an up cycle, it's definitely a little bit more challenging to work with landlords. Um, you know, it's just, there's more competition for the properties. Um, so people looking for lease spaces outweigh the actual amount of spaces that are available. And ultimately the landlords are also paying more for the real estate that they're acquiring. So lease rates have to go up in order for them to get their ROI on their investment. Um, and I think we're seeing that in a lot of different markets in the country right now. Yeah, I I agree with you. Uh, you know, I think almost every market in the country right now during an, you know, during this economic quote unquote recovery from the economic downturn of say 2009, 2010, we are seeing, you know, real estate prices going up and, you know, like people are still looking for ways to make money in the world and they are pouring money into real estate and there's foreign investment in real estate. So you're right. All those things kind of drive the landlords to have to charge more. And so, you know, why don't you talk a little bit about specifically what happens in a deal during an up market? Yeah. So in, in any deal, in any market, one of the biggest pieces that you have to transfer is is the lease and you have to do an assignment from the current um, owner of the business to the new owner, um, which ultimately le- means that the landlord has, landlord has to get involved. Um, and in a market like this, when you go to the landlord to do that assignment, um, sometimes it's not very black and white how that assignment takes place and it opens the door for the landlord to renegotiate certain terms of the lease. So they might be looking for an increase in rent. Um, They might be looking for a larger security deposit to protect themselves and the risk of that transition of the business. You know, we've also seen landlords, um, you know, try and be a little bit more picky about what type of tenants are going into these spaces. So when we go to do that assignment, they might ask the buyer for things like a business plan and additional personal guarantees and, you know, like I said, the additional security deposit, but they're just really looking to make sure they have the best, highest paying tenant in that property at that given time. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes it can it can affect the deal if the landlord doesn't believe that the buyer coming to the table is as secure or more secure than the current owner of the business. Yeah. It could just flat out kill the deal that the landlord doesn't accept the person. And then as you said, you know, the, the businesses, uh, the landlords, excuse me, want, you know, a higher price sometimes. So it's their chance to renegotiate the lease and, you know, say we have a, a bank financing situation going on or even just the business you know, when we do a recast, and we're going to talk about recast in another podcast, but when we do a recast, we're saying this business makes, say, $250,000. Well, guess what happens if the landlord, you know, raises the rent by $2,000 a month or, you know, $4,000 a month? Well, guess what? That's another twenty-five dollars to $50,000 gone from the gone from the income, which immediately devalues the deal, which can kill an SBA loan. Yeah. And, and kill a deal ultimately, because then you're talking about an entirely different valuation, which I know we're going to talk about in a future podcast too, is how we get to those valuation numbers. 
So yeah, so ultimately an upmarket can be very challenging um, to get deals done when you have to do that, that transfer of the lease. Sure. Sure. We see that. And that, and that's what we're seeing. And so you're going to hear from some of our uh, people around the country, uh, some of our uh, guests that we'll bring on, and uh, they're going to give you a, a little bit of a report. Uh, and I think uh, what you're going to hear is mostly that, you know, things are on the way up or at least peaking. So it'll be interesting to hear from them. Yeah. So Andy, what talk a little bit about what happens in the opposite. Like what happens in a in a down market, you know, when we're heading into a recession or even in a recession in, in relation to real estate and transferring leases. Yeah, so obviously selling businesses uh where I started in Florida, you know, for over 20 years. We never had a, you know, Florida's growing. People are moving to Florida. The the real estate prices have already had always been on the increase and then, you know, there was a little bit of a blip uh, here and there along the way, uh, maybe 2001 after 9-11, uh, maybe, uh, maybe earlier in the 90s, there was a couple little blips, but nothing like 2009. So at the end of 2009, uh, we have basically an economic collapse in the marketplace. Uh, building literally stops, how, home building stops. Uh, Immigration to Florida was uh, clipping at about 1,000 people a day, 300,000 people a year. Literally goes down to population loss in some of the bigger counties where people were like, okay, you know, now it's time to get out of Florida and, you know, go somewhere else where there's jobs. So what we saw in that part was, you know, obviously pretty good for buyers and sometimes good for, you know, the sellers that they could, you know, basically go back to the landlords and renegotiate. And if we're in the middle of a deal, um, or even just before a deal is, is, is going to go to marketplace, the sellers can go back to the landlord and say, Hey, they had two years left. Well, we saw some people going back and saying to the landlords, Hey, would you give me a five-year lease if I signed right now? And some, you know, the landlords are losing people left and right. They're trying to uh, renegotiate their their loans on the commercial property and shore up, you know, and try to stave off uh, losing buildings. So they were uh, signing people up to lease extensions, lease, lease options. And this was a huge opportunity for small business owners to go back to their landlords, renegotiate, be able to put a little bit more money on the bottom line, which made their business more attractive to selling. And we didn't slow down in the number of businesses we sold uh, during that time period, what we saw was businesses um, continuing to sell and people, you know, seeking out what we used to call the survivors, uh, the businesses that were uh, solid, maybe lost some income, but still were making money. So I think that's where we saw this, you know, a huge increase in this fast casual restaurant kind of boom. Yeah. So ultimately then, you know, it was beneficial to the owners and beneficial to the deals, adding more profitability, securing long-term lease at favorable, favorable rates. So that ultimately helped the deals get done and, and probably helped evaluations too. Yeah. I mean, so it, it did help everything except, you know, there was no bank financing available. All the banks had, were running scared. The SBA program literally uh, collapsed in 2009, 2010. We went from doing, you know, uh, dozens and dozens of SBA loans uh, in a year's time down to three in 2010. So so we definitely had to get creative. Uh, the landlords were part of the solution, not uh, they were less of part of the problem. Uh, they were <laughs> very much willing to uh, lease out space and people were even moving their businesses uh, to save money. I did that in uh, 2009 as well. And landlords were, uh, you know, literally willing to renegotiate. So, it, you know, a down market could be an opportunity for people to buy a business and to, and or if they're in business, to make themselves more profitable. So, you know, I think everybody should watch out for that. You know, as we talk to people out there, I think uh, when we talk to fellow trans world business advisor brokers across the country, I'm not quite sure we're going to find anybody in a down market right now, but it could be coming. Yeah, it could. And it's, it's good for the listeners to hear both scenarios and kind of be prepared for one or the other. But we have some great stories to share today of um, deals and some some landlord challenges that they had overcome and also some, some updates on the markets across the country. Great. Uh, let's get to it. 
Transworld Business Advisors is the world's largest business brokerage and mergers and acquisitions firm with over 500 brokers in nearly 200 offices worldwide. Transworld's team handles thousands of business sales every year. To be connected with a qualified business broker or learn more about the buying and selling process, visit tworld.com forward slash the deal board or call 888-719-9098. All right, welcome back. And today we're talking about landlord issues and the commercial real estate market and really how that's affecting deals getting done. And today I have Stephen Hansen from San Diego joining us to tell us a little bit about what's going on in commercial real estate and related to mergers and acquisitions on the West Coast. So Stephen, tell us a little bit about how commercial real estate's affecting any deals, if any, um, that you guys are doing out in California. Sure. Uh, The commercial real estate market tends to be very, very hot, and we foresee that uh, continue uh, in Southern California for the balance of this year and into next year. Biggest impacts that's having is when we come up for uh, a sale and a lease renewal that the property managers and business, uh, excuse me, uh, owners of real estate are looking for higher rents, higher security deposits, and are also not willing to give uh, extended options on new deals. So that's creating a bit of a downward pressure on getting deals done as we you know, navigate uh, what commercial real estate owners are demanding now of new tenants. Stephen, what um, given all that, what are some things that you know you as a business broker or even owners of businesses can do ahead of a deal to help prevent these, you know, deal killers from popping up um, related to commercial real estate? One of the things that we're finding, Jessica, is to really move uh, earlier into the game and connecting with the property manager uh, for the business in question. A year ago or more, we used to wait further into the process to get in touch with the um, property manager. Now it's really something we move up into the earlier part of the process to see what they're looking for, what kind of security deposit, what type of uh, lease uh, changes they may be wanting, uh, especially if it's a lease that has, let's say, a couple of years left on it, and the new person would like to have uh, some options or extension on that lease. We'd like to get that on the table earlier than do an awful lot of work through due diligence and then get into escrow and then bam, we have a big landlord problem. So we're just moving that up earlier into our deal process so that if there are surprises, we we have identified them earlier in the game. Okay, great, great plan of attack. Also, I guess it sounds like too that if you're a seller, it's never a bad idea to have additional options if you can get them ahead of time, even before you're thinking about selling your business, especially because we know if you're going to finance a transaction with like an SBA loan or something like that, you have to have adequate options to be able to cover the lifespan of the loan in most cases. So is that something that sellers could do too, even if they're not thinking about selling, but just negotiating those additional options to lock in the rent rates? Yeah, that's a great question. And we go through that through part of the exit planning strategy with sellers quite frequently now. We have a number of people come in and say, well, um, we talk about the lease after we get through with their opinion and value and other parts of their business. And we say, okay, what's your lease look like? And they'll say, well, gee, um, month to month, or I have less than a year left. So we start talking about that and saying, you know, one of the things you can do to help sell your business and bring more value to your business is to get your lease in place now. And get that month-to-month lease um, buttoned up into a lease for two years, three years, five years, whatever it might be. But month-to-month is uh, not a good way to go into a uh, negotiations with your landlord when you bring a new new potential buyer in. So that is one of the things we're asking sellers to look at is to get their lease and think of it as uh, an asset, almost like a balance sheet item for them and to bring that to the table to the buyer saying, look, I've got a really good, strong lease for you at good, favorable rates. And um, I've already taken care of that for you. 
That's great. I love, I love that. Think of your lease as an asset because it is, it's a part of the business. Well, thanks so much, Stephen, for joining us and give us an, giving us an update on what's going on in the West Coast related to commercial real estate. And we look forward to having you back on the podcast soon. Thank you very much. And have a great day. Hey, uh, we're back with Eric Strauss and we're just checking in with uh, different markets around the country because uh, we're talking about this landlord uh, issue. And we, we've been talking about some markets getting uh, that are very hot and some markets that might not be so hot or even predicting that they're not going to be so hot in the future. So, Eric, what are you seeing in New York City? Well, prediction wise, maybe I'm just an optimist by nature, but landlords here are just really, really difficult to work with. And ever since I've been doing this business, I'm always amazed how there are so many business owners here who are working seven days a week and the landlords are the one getting rich. And they, uh, they're they really impossible to deal with. Um, the best thing I can say about any landlords we've dealt with is, is they are very difficult. That's the best thing I can ever say. <laughs> um, my prediction is, and maybe this is optimistic, but there are a lot, there are a lot of empty storefronts in New York City now. And I think that, you know, we know that the internet has had, had an impact on, on retail around the country, and, and that certainly is true here. My sense is that landlords are going to have to start getting more reasonable as more retail goes out, right? And so um, I, I just think they're going to have to, I just think it's the law of supply and demand. They, 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 there are so many empty spaces right now, and rents are not coming down. And at some point, the landlord's going to have to capitulate and bring rents down and start to take care of the customer again. That's my hope. And I hope I'm right. <laughs> yeah, I think we've seen that before. And that's when, you know, the small business world gets opportunistic. And, uh, you know, some of these big companies come in and they're pouring money into these spaces. And uh, it's always sometimes the second guy that gets the best deal. So uh, mm -hmm. we'll see. Good points. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for coming on. Thanks so much. Hey, Andy, you know what time I think it is? I think it's time to talk about our deal of the week. Deal of the week. All right. So each week we like to feature a deal, what we call the deal of the week. And we often like to highlight deals that we do for good people. So good deals for good people. So this week we have Matt Prescott from our Denver office uh, talking about a moving company that we sold in a rural market recently. So Matt, I'll let you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about this deal and how they found us and what kind of company it was. Yeah, thanks, Jessica. Hey, this is Matt, um, broker here, Transworld Denver. Recently completed a deal uh, up in a rural area up in the mountains. Um, and I, I wanted to highlight this deal just because I thought uh, the people that we were able to help out both on the buy and the sell side, um, you know, really knew what they were doing. And it was just a really good deal for everybody involved. What size was the business and what were kind of some metrics and the numbers of the deal? Yeah, sure. So it was, it was a pretty sizable little business for uh, what I've seen up in the mountains. Um, their top line revenue was about uh, just a touch under seven hundred and ninety thousand. Um, I calculated their discretionary earnings at about two hundred and sixty-two thousand, um, and we were able to bring them to the market at five hundred and seventy-five thousand. So, before we get into the buyer and deal structure and everything, what prompted these business owners to want to sell? What what was the the pull for them deciding to um, walk away from the business and and do something else? Sure. Yeah. And that that's kind of one of the more interesting pieces of this uh, story, I think. So they actually reached out to us. Um, unfortunately, they had um, a little bit of a tragedy in their lives. Um, so the, the business was owned by a great husband and wife team. They had been running the business for about 18 years. Uh, they had two children. And unfortunately, one of their children actually passed away. So that is, was kind of the driving force behind it. They really just wanted to exit the business and move uh, out of state to be closer to their other child. So that's um, kind of how it all started. So we know every deal has its challenges and problems that we have to work through. What were some of the challenges that you faced in this transaction? Yeah, so I think well, the main challenge was just given its geographic location, it was a little bit more difficult to uh, find a buyer. Um, just because, like you know, we had mentioned, it was in a more rural area. I think that kind of shrunk our buyer pool. 
Um, so that was one of the main challenges. Uh, and another one of the challenges, uh, just not to get too into it, but unfortunately, the seller's mother actually ended up passing away in the midst of our deal um, during the due diligence process. So needless to say, her head uh, wasn't completely there um, and she knew most of the financial data. So she was an integral part to the deal. And obviously, you know, we don't want to push someone who's going through something like that. Um, So just the balance of um, really, you know, continuing to to coach her through the deal, but also being, you know, very cognizant of, of what she's going through. Um, so I think that was a, another challenge on the deal. So you eventually found a great buyer and really a perfect fit uh, for this business. So tell us a little bit about how you found that buyer and you know what his intentions were for the business. Yeah, so we actually found this buyer. We had made a connection um, with him through his searches for other businesses in our listing portfolio. So being able to learn what he was looking for, primarily you know, a B2C service company, um, just, you know, in Colorado in general. But um, so the first time I engaged him wasn't even on this deal, but in, in talking to him and learning what he's looking for, we were able to uh, put this deal in front of him um, and it checked a lot of the boxes. Um, and again, uh, you know, at the beginning of the podcast, I think I mentioned it was, you know, a pretty cool story for both sides of the deal. But this gentleman um, was actually a U.S. veteran, uh, very savvy, ended up becoming um, pretty financially successful in his own right after his uh, service ended. And his whole idea was to purchase these businesses um, and actually input new veterans coming back uh, from their service into them in a management role and then structure the deal with them as to, um, that way down the line, they would be able to buy him out um, and they would have the business on their own. But he was able to kind of coach and mentor um you know, the new, the new veteran in the business. So it was actually really, really neat business structure. It's a really great story of providing jobs for veterans coming back from service and also developing them as entrepreneurs, especially in the veteran community. Now there's actually a decrease in the level of entrepreneurs over time. So it's a great, great story. So Matt, um, tell us a little bit about the deal metrics. What was the final selling price? How was the deal structured? Things like that. Yeah. So I think we were able to get them a, a, a very fair price for the business. We ended up selling uh, at $525,000 um, total purchase price. And then we structured that uh, with cash and carry. Um, so the majority of the cash up front, uh, along with, uh, I believe it was about a 20% uh, seller carry note on it, just to um, make the buyer a little bit more comfortable, free up a little bit of the uh, capital, um, just because he did want to make a couple tweaks of the business, um, add a truck or so, and some additional storage units. Um, so it really worked out you know, really well for everybody involved. Great. It's a great story and, and a good example of doing good deals for good people. Thanks so much, Matt, for sharing with us. And thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Thank you, Jess. Welcome back, everybody. And today we're talking again about leases and landlords and really how they affect your business sale. And like we've heard from some of our experts across the country, this is a problem or a challenge that we have to overcome in almost every market. So I have with me uh, Phil Kubot, who's a commercial real estate expert and is really just going to give a background on what's going on in the marketplace across the country and what we should be aware of in regards to commercial real estate. So welcome to the show, Phil. And if you don't mind, just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure. So thanks a lot for the time, Jessica, today. I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk to you and your group. Uh, I'm a commercial real estate broker and have been for 15 plus years. Um here in the Denver market. I work for Berkshire Hathaway's commercial real estate division. uh, And we're a full service brokerage firm where we work with buyers, tenants, sellers, landlords uh, to help them through their commercial real estate process. Thanks, Phil. So one of the things that we've been talking about on the deal board um, for this episode, and we've got a couple more coming up, is that when we're going to sell a business, we're starting to experience more challenges because of it being an up market. Um, so tell us a little bit about what the marketplace um, is doing right now. Like, what does an up market mean? How does that affect demand? And kind of what are you seeing? Yeah, absolutely. So I think across the board, you're seeing pricing go up. You know, when we talk about uh, commercial real estate vacancy rates, it's all going to come down to supply and demand. So Uh, Right now, supply is super tight, so that puts landlords and sellers in the driver's seat. So they're commanding things like rental rates, um, concessions that are offered on deals, timelines, 
and quite frankly, there's a lot of competition for spaces. So um, they're in a stronger position than a tenant or a buyer would be. So one of the things that we're experiencing when we're trying to sell deals is that when we go to assign the lease to a new business owner, landlords are starting to try to renegotiate those terms like the rental rates or security deposits. Do you have any advice for business owners on how they can protect themselves from that not happening during the closing process? Yeah, sure. I think one of the best ways to protect themselves is through their uh, their initial lease negotiation. Always make sure you have an assignability or a sublease clause in your lease that'll help um, transition you a little bit quicker into selling your business. Uh, and then also terms are, are things along the lines of the ability to take contiguous space or have a first right of refusal can help too. But most landlords in this market are out there looking to get market rates Don't forget, a lot of your sellers have probably signed uh, leases back when the market was softer and rental rates were lower. So uh, landlords are going to look to reposition their assets so that they're getting market rates. Um, And term always goes a long way with a landlord. So the longer term you can give a landlord, the better chance you have of renegotiating your lease. That's great. And actually, we're we're seeing too, if you're financing the deal through a loan um, with a bank or the SBA that most of those bankers want to see longer term loans too, or at least options um, that will survive the length of the loan. So can can an option work in that that place too? It, would a landlord still consider that a longer term lease uh, with some options on it? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think most landlords are going to look at your initial term as their guarantee on the lease, right? So if there's an initial term of five years, the clock pretty much stops then. The benefit of having an option is for a tenant to lock into a long-term lease at hopefully rental rates that are stabilized. And so, um, you know, a landlord is definitely going to look at initial term only, but a lender will look at option rights too. So a five-year with a five-year option or a a 10-year with two five-year options, um, a bank will account for all of those term years, whereas a landlord is just going to look at initial term. Okay. Okay. Great point. So let's flip to more of the buyer side. So say, you know, I'm, I'm looking to buy a business. I'm going to purchase a business from an existing business owner, and I'm going to assume that lease. What we're seeing is that the landlords are being a little bit, not just on the, the rent, but they're being a little bit more selective on the buyer side too. So talk a little bit about how a landlord would vet um, a new tenant in that perspective, and maybe some of the things they might ask for from that new tenant. Yeah, sure. So uh, the number one thing that a landlord is going to look at is is the financial viability of the new tenant. So it's always great to have some sort of a personal financial statement prepared that you can send over with your initial offering so that the landlord can vet them out financially. Second would be maybe to have some uh, past performance P&Ls on the current business uh, that they can look at to see how the business has been trending over the last 12 to 24 months. Um And then that's going to impact things like tenant improvement allowances, the amount of money that a landlord's willing to put towards tenant improvements. Uh, It's going to affect your security deposit. Uh, Sometimes a landlord may ask for more security on the deal if uh, they don't feel like the financials are strong enough. And then lastly, I always like to send over a business plan as well. Something that kind of states out what the new owner is going to do differently um, and and what, what their background is and what they're going to bring to the table. Great. Great. What about personal guarantees? I mean, we've seen, um, you know, most landlords are acquiring this now. Is there any way to get out of a personal guarantee or is that pretty much a given with any lease for a new tenant at this point? Sure. Uh, Great question. So uh, the rule of thumb in commercial real estate is that everything's negotiable. So just because you're getting presented with a personal guarantee doesn't necessarily mean you can't negotiate the terms Sometimes people will guarantee a little bit more early on in their lease and then have a burn-off period on those personal guarantees. Uh, Other times people are required to guarantee the entire lease itself. But just know that those terms are negotiable. Usually I would recommend having an attorney handle that negotiation. But, um, you know, here in the market that I work in, there's almost always a personal guarantee attached to a deal. Great. Thanks so much, Phil. So now we're definitely in an up market in most areas of the country. I mean, what's your prediction? Do you think this is going to continue or um, do we see a softening coming anytime soon? What What do you see on the horizon? So if you talk to an economist, I think what they would say is, is that you got to watch the job numbers. 
the vacancy rates and pricing are typically tied to how many jobs there are being fulfilled out there. And if you start to look at the jobs data in some of the higher end markets across the country, you'll notice that uh, the job market or the labor market is under a lot of pressure. So with that is going to come an adjustment. So that's on the tenant and landlord side. You're going to start to see pricing stabilize. You're going to start to see vacancy stabilize. On the purchase side, um, you're going to want to watch the bond market. So as the Fed starts to turn up rates, the bond market will follow. And what you'll start to notice is that people will start getting priced out of the market and it'll be harder to get loans um, on, on new buildings. So two things to watch out for are your bond markets and your, your labor. All right. Those great tips for great tips for our listeners and our business owners. I mean, like we said, you know, an, an up market's good for business, you know, all business is doing well, but it does put landlords um, and building owners in a stronger negotiation position, which can make getting business deals done a little bit more difficult, but it's just some things that to be aware of. And I think Phil gave us some great advice here today that we can do up front with the leases um, and also some negotiation tips when we're trying to get the deals closed. So, Phil, thank you so much for joining us today. Great. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Hey, Jessica, you know what time it is? Money time? Almost. It's time for Listing of the Week. Yeah, it's time for Listing of the Week. And uh, I again, I have Tom Milano with us. And he has a... Uh, you just got back from scuba diving. You picked up a listing on the way, didn't you? I sure did, Andy. Um, I'll tell you, uh, I was out in the Eastern Caribbean. Uh, in one of the beautiful Dutch islands close to St. Martin, uh, which had a 20-year-old uh, scuba diving center. And um, this place was absolutely fabulous. What, what an amazing fantasy island. Uh, it sounds like a great place. So tell me a little bit about the deal. How, you know, how much money does it make? It's, it certainly sounds like a place where if you're looking to get away from it all, this is a great place to kind of get away to and make money. Yeah, yeah. This business, like I said, has been around for over 20 years. Um, it currently grosses about a million dollars a year. Um, that million dollar gives uh, an operating owner about $250,000 a year in, in, in adjusted net profit. The business is fully staffed, uh, comes with two dive boats, uh, fully equipped, great reputation, and uh, is really on a wonderful island. Uh, very American friendly, very European friendly. Everyone speaks English. Everyone's on the American dollar and uh, really just an amazing all around place. So how much is it selling for? Uh, we're on the market for $895,000 and uh, with an owner coming up with about $600,000, the owner would consider financing the balance. And again, that includes two uh, custom made dive boats, uh, and tons of equipment and uh, well over 20 years worth of goodwill. All right. Sounds like a great business to get away and fly away and uh, enjoy the rest of your life and make some money. Thanks for coming on, Tom. Thank you, Andy. Hey, we're with Eric Woodworth from Chevy Chase, Maryland area. And again, uh, that is the D.C. metro area. And D.C. is always hot. You know, it's, uh, it's obviously the capital of the United States. So, uh, you know, there's always a lot of activity in that city. Uh, but why don't you give us a little update what's happening in the D.C. area, Eric? Yeah, thanks, Andy. Uh, Washington, D.C., always an attractive market to do business. Uh, both the government there, the technology, uh, and the government, the military contracting keep um, keep the place humming. Now, as far as the real estate, you know, I focus a good bit on Northwest D.C. and its nearby suburbs. And those areas have traditionally been the highly desirable, expensive parts from a leasing standpoint. And what we're finding is that there's there are a lot of emerging neighborhoods around D.C. And those areas are hot, hot, hot. And a lot of people are moving into those areas, bringing rents up dramatically, whereas Georgetown type neighborhoods that have big names are recognized as kind of the, the luxury end of the market. Uh, are seeing some vacancies. And landlords, you know, what is always a little difficult from a business broker standpoint is that the landlords are not necessarily accepting just any tenant in there just to fill the spaces and not necessarily reducing the rents. 
And instead, they're holding off to get very high quality, uh, almost corporate type accounts. And so it's, it's becoming a lot tougher to get some of these, um, these buyers approved in this environment. Great. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into our show today. If you like the podcast, don't forget to subscribe through your favorite podcasting app and leave us a review. If you have questions or suggestions for the show, visit us at tworld slash the deal board or email us at the deal board at tworld.com. Thank you.